Sounds good. Thank you so much for the introduction, Erica. And thank you for everyone tuning in today as we explore the rationale behind vegetables, why they might be a good idea. And we'll review tons of practical ways to add more veggies to the diet. So my name is Riley McCorkle. I'm a dietitian and diabetes educator at Providence. You know, on our diabetes education side and the community wellness side, we certainly meet with a lot of people for a variety of conditions and vegetables impact many of those conditions. So this will be an action-packed lecture today. So I'm going to dive in. First of all, my disclosures, I do work for Providence. I also like to include a nutrition bias. You know, each person is so unique and what works for one person doesn't work for another. And as much as we try as healthcare professionals to set aside our biases, it's best to be aware of our innate leanings. And my bias is definitely toward local vor, I recognize, um, and small planet, which involves a lot of lentils, beans, and peas, basically. Um, I also tend to encourage a lot of meal prepping, I realize. Um, and sometimes that's not always feasible for people. So we'll look at some other strategies today. So the agenda in part one will cover the why. This will be very research heavy. We'll explore some of the research evaluating the effects of vegetable intake on various conditions and overall health. And in part two, we will put the theory to practice. So whatever obstacles you may have, we'll find strategies to uh, make it more easy to get vegetables. So we will cover the why and the how. And if you want to cover the who, I would just refer you to the album, My Generation. It's for those uh, rock and rollers out there. So in part one, the why. The Dietary Guidelines for Americans give us some overall reasons of why vegetables might be a good idea. People who eat vegetables, they say, are likely to have a reduced risk of some diseases. And those diseases they specify are heart disease, like, like heart, heart attacks and strokes. And there's also evidence to show that vegetables are cancer protective as well. What do vegetables have in them? Well, they have lots of fiber, which can reduce cholesterol. They are low in fat and calories. They're also rich in vitamins, potassium, folate, vitamin A, um, that helps with healthy skin and prevention of infections, and vitamin C that helps, to, helps cuts and wounds to heal up and promotes healthy teeth and gums and helps us to absorb iron. So those are just some of the overall features of veggies. This is also courtesy of the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. The purple is, represents how many people are kind of above the recommended amounts of these various foods. And the blue is where we're falling short of the guidelines. And we'll see total vegetables um, and all the subcategories of vegetables, we have some room for improvement. So because I have a captive audience here, I'd like to cover a research topic. And to understand the impact of vegetables, a lot of these research articles will use what's called a risk ratio. And please forgive this suboptimal metaphor, but because Halloween's next week, we have two groups of trick-or-treaters. One of those groups eats a well-balanced dinner before they go out trick-or-treating. Of the group who doesn't eat a dinner before trick-or-treating, three of them end up with stomach aches at the end of the night. And only one of the group, one of the trick-or-treaters ends up with a stomach ache after eating dinner. So this is what we call a risk ratio of 0.33. That means that if we have dinner before trick-or-treating, we're only a third as likely 
to end up with the tummy ache. So let's see how risk ratios are used in research. We'll start with a pretty large study. This is from over 71,000 women. Uh, this actually comes from the nurses' health study. So they, so they were all nurses, and part of the research involved a food frequency questionnaire. So how many times a week do you have whole grains? How many times a week do you have ice cream? And what they found is, uh, I know there's kind of a lot of information here, but we have green leafy vegetables have a risk ratio of 0.9. So that's like a 10% reduced risk of getting diabetes for those in a high green leafy vegetable category. Some of these other numbers here, we have uh, Q1 and Q5, that is quintiles. So the lowest 20% of people were having about a half portion of green leafy vegetables a day. And the, the highest 20% were having about one and a half portions of green leafy vegetables. And they are the ones that saw the benefit. Um, some other, you'll see these ranges. Um, so it doesn't apply to everyone, but generally ends up being below that one um, risk ratio. And then the P, the P value is like the probability that this result is a fluke. So this is kind of less than a 1% possibility that, that this just happened to chance. Um, the, the study also looked at one extra serving of green leafy vegetables and didn't find that much more of a benefit, but still similar. This is noteworthy in the, especially in our diabetes education clinic, a lot of people say, what about fruits? I'm concerned about my blood sugars and con consuming fruits. And will that put me at risk for diabetes if, if I'm uh, in a pre-diabetes category? Well, the answer is fruits uh, are protective according to the nurse's health study. We find that those who had higher amounts of fruit actually had a lower risk of developing diabetes, potentially due to the fiber content of fruits and the vitamins and minerals that are really supporting our metabolism and staving off diabetes. So that was kind of a busy slide. Um, just so you don't have to listen to my voice for the whole hour, I want to ask you some questions. So we have a poll. All I'd like to know is how this presentation is going so far. <laughs> with the heavy research we have. Look at that, we've got mostly, well, I'll, I'll share the results in a moment. Uh, just a few more seconds to choose your answer. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. So for most people, so far so good. I'm glad to hear it. Um, I, I can slow down a little bit, especially for the real busy slides coming up. And uh, I'm glad to hear that it's fascinating for some. So another similar study is the Shanghai Women's Health Study. So also having um, 64,000 women food frequency questionnaire. This study subdivided it into different vegetable categories. So we can kind of look at the risk ratios of different veggie categories. The amazing thing that you might notice here is that um, the yellow vegetables are by far the lowest. So nearly cutting your diabetes risk in half by including things like sweet potatoes and carrots. Uh, so that is reassuring that uh, those fiber foods can help us out. Um, I guess one more thing I will note on this is uh, the lower quintile for these Shanghai women um, uh, was 120 grams. So that's roughly equivalent to one and a half servings. Uh, so you'll see a difference between kind of like those who are following a standard American diet versus um, in the East what's low over there in terms of veggie intake is, is different from low over here. 
here's just one more systematic review and meta-analysis, which is basically a combination, a statistical combination of a bunch of research. Uh, we have various categories of fruits and vegetables and their respective risk ratios. So um, looks like the better of them are reducing by a quarter. And just for kind of a counterpoint study here, this is another meta-analysis, lot, uh, kind of a statistical conglomerate of 22 studies. The participants here were greater than 50 years old, so they excluded anybody under 50. And they did not find the same results for vegetable intake. Those who consumed uh, greater than four portions, what they defined as 80 grams of vegetables, um, had just about the same risk as those who, who consumed one and a half portions. So whether that has to do with um, maybe they already had diabetes by the time they were 50, or um, maybe those with diabetes started eating more vegetables, whatever it was, it kind of made the result a wash. Um, however, they still saw the benefit of fruits with about a 14% reduction in diabetes onset, um, and they did see a benefit of green leafy vegetables. Okay, this is one I could probably slow down for. So we're looking at cardiovascular disease now. This is kind of a study within a study. So we have this um, systematic review of over 12,000 participants, um, but they, they kind of examined the PREDIMED study, which had less than 8,000 participants. In the PREDIMED, they, um, they use the Mediterranean diet. So this is not the same as just increasing vegetables, although vegetables are a big part of the Mediterranean diet. Um, they defined the Mediterranean diet as plant-based foods, fruits, vegetables, and legumes. But they also have these, these aspects of different oils. So MUFA would be like your unsaturated fats, heart healthy fats compared to your saturated fats. And, um, and additional components that Mediterranean diet is known for, like the, like the low to moderate wine intake, whole grains, and more fish than meat, and then um, moderate dairy as well. They saw some reduction in cardiovascular disease mortality, um, but that that result ranged quite a bit, um, maybe due to our impressive emergency services for responding and preventing mortality from these sorts of cardiovascular complica complications. Then we have mortality, a wash uh, didn't really affect total mortality. But the real takeaway is the strokes. So 40% reduced risk of strokes for those who are more adhering to a Mediterranean diet. One of my absolute favorites, something I love to talk about, the Lion Diet Heart Study. Um, this was a smaller study, but uh, all these 600 participants had coronary heart disease. So they were already on that cardiovascular path there. And with the Mediterranean diet plus the olive oil or tree nuts, um, compared to what standard practice is just a low fat diet for those at risk of heart disease, compared to the low fat diet, those who ate more Mediterranean reduced their cardiovascular disease mortality by two thirds. That my friends is on par with eating dinner before going trick or treating in our fake study from earlier. There was also a reduction in total mortality from all causes. Um, you can cut your risk of cardiovascular disease in half with a sort of eating pattern. I will also mention that their, their intervention was not a private chef for Mediterranean diet. It was not provided meals. It was only Mediterranean diet advice, just what the Mediterranean diet is and how you can incorporate it in your life. And that is what resulted in these reductions. So pretty incredible there, um, if I might say so myself. I'm also interested to dig into this more and find out what made their intervention so much more effective for, for a cardiac population. 
Okay, in case you just love risk ratios, there's lots more from a review by Dariush Mo Mozafarian in it. It's basically looking at our nutrition, so fruits, vegetables, leafy greens, legumes, whole grains, and looking at our risk ratios. So as we kind of look down, we can see some impressive risk ratios, especially for the effect of green leafy vegetables on diabetes, also the effect of legumes on diabetes and, um, and whole grains for all these disease states. And the list goes on. So then we're looking at specific fibers and their effect on heart disease and diabetes. Um, some of the more impressive ones seem like cereal fiber for reducing diabetes onset and also total dietary fiber for reducing diabetes. And if any of you are interested, I can send along these articles after, but let's look at the effect of vegetables on obesity. So for this, I had a systematic review and meta-analysis, basically showing that the more vegetables we eat, the less likely we are to have unintentional weight gain. And to give you a sense of what 100 grams of vegetables, if we're kind of starting down this curve, 100 grams could be two celery stalks, um, a really large carrot, two thirds of a bell pepper, a third of a cucumber, or almost two cups of lettuce. And that should start us on the path. Um, kind of fun to remind folks that the more uh, more of certain foods that we eat, the less likely we are to weigh, which is kind of the idea behind the CDC's Eat More, Weigh Less brochure. Here's one more pretty significant systematic review. This is mostly looking at protein foods. So we have all of these um, various animal and otherwise source, sources of protein. And down here, we're looking at um, how much weight gain on the right side or weight loss occurred with more sources of these foods. So this is for every, um, linking it to every source of each of these. So, and, and just for reference, the uh, about a half kilogram is 1.1 pounds. And so that, um, you know, toward the top on the right side of the spectrum, we see the common culprits, the hamburgers and hot dogs and bacon, yada, yada. Um, in the middle, it's kind of hard to say, you know, dairy um, might be due to the quality of dairy, may have benefits or not. And then down here, we have some of the nuts and the lean proteins and seafood. Um, and even, even plain yogurt came in pretty respective, respectable. Just a final slide on the research intensive portion here. A summary from Mosafarian looked at, just summarized those foods that have benefit for cardiovascular disease, those that it probably depends on the quantity and the quality and then those foods that are more associated with cardiovascular disease. No huge surprises there. Wow, we made it through the research section. So part two, we'll look at the how. We've discussed the theory, but how do we put that to practice? I'll give you a moment here to grab maybe a, a pen and notepad or something. Um, I'll be throwing a lot of ideas out there, uh, feel free to jot down any ideas that might be useful. And please feel free to um, offer us ideas in the chat if you have any other suggestions about um, making it easy to get vegetables. So despite the benefits of vegetables, just telling somebody to eat more vegetables is not always the best advice. Perhaps we're not considering the taste preferences of, of us or our families. Maybe 
we're not considering the time for meal prep or even the affordability and access of veggies. Now, food security is similar to hunger, but typically the hunger experienced in the US population is lower than the food insecurity. So food insecurity is more common because it has to do with the limited or uncertain access to adequate food. It's uh, some more recent data in 2020, almost 14 million US households were food insecure at some point during the year. Fortunately, that's dropped somewhat to 8.4 million. And here we can look at food insecurity as a proportion of the whole population. So really when, um, when recommending to eat more vegetables, one out of 10 people that we offer that advice to, uh, it's, it's not an issue of wanting to eat vegetables, it's just an issue of access. Here we can look at food insecurity over time. Just hovering below 15% generally. And geographically, the green areas here are, are areas that are considered low income and that have a grocery store greater than 10 miles away for the rural population or greater than one mile away for urban communities. And here's a zoom in at our state. There have been many concerns lately about inflation impacting the access to vegetables and other foods. So here we're kind of looking at the changes from mid-century, how much we were, what percent of our income we were spending on groceries. And fortunately that's come down some, um, but in the last few years, we've definitely seen a pretty abrupt uh, spike upwards. Okay, our second and final poll here. So what I would like to know is what is your biggest obstacle to eating vegetables? Give just a few moments more. Okay, that looks great. So it was really neck and neck here. Sounds like uh, the time consideration for prepping veg is it kind of edges out everything else. I'm glad to see that many of you, um, life is perfect and you eat a lot of veggies. Uh, but also cost and taste are considerations. So, and um, for those who responses don't apply, uh, let, let me know, and um, we can we can make our polls more realistic. So, for you budgeters out there, here's some ideas for keeping vegetables from breaking the bank. We'll first look at food banks and food pantries. Foodfinder.us is a wonderful resource where we can type in any zip code and hopefully end up with a lot of these red um, pins where if we click on any of them, we see the information about um, when these pantries are open and what they provide. Another good resource is thefigtree.org. Um, this kind of goes above and beyond food, but also has uh, meal options and other goods. 
For the budgeters, we also have federal, state, and local benefits. So for SNAP, for those of you that might be unfamiliar, that's Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It is federally, federally funded, but state operated. To be eligible for SNAP benefits requires a bank balance of less than $2,000 or a bank balance of less than 3,000 with a dependent. Meals on Wheels is eligible for those at least 60 years old. Head Start program is for women and children ages zero to five years old. For um, families with income at or below the federal poverty level. And then getting more locally, we have the Women and Children's Free Restaurant and the Senior Farmer's Market Nutrition Program, which provides a stipend for accessing fresh foods at farmer's markets. And we also have Food for All by Catholic Charities who connect local farms to other markets of, uh, for those who are in need. For the budgeters, I'll also make my sales pitch for dry ingredients. So we're taking uh, protein sources head to head. For chicken, uh, an average, well, chicken prices usually range between just under a dollar to almost $3. And you get 96 grams of protein per pound. For chickpeas, uh, definitely less protein, but even uh, even less cost. Um, really, really cost effective. And the added benefits of fiber and and low saturated fat for these uh, plant proteins. Here's a price range for pork and protein per pound. Lentils. Um, Little less than half the protein, but far less than half the cost. I'll also note that these plant proteins are usually a portion of these is uh, a cup or beyond. So pretty uh, hefty portion of these foods, whereas the uh, animal proteins are usually a three ounce or what might be a palm of a hand. Then we look at beef in comparison to black bean burgers, um, definitely those black bean burgers are pretty cost effective and a, a reasonable amount of protein. And finally, for the budgeters, we have gleaning and gardening. For you green thumbs out there, do you ever consider what a pity it is for all those plums from the tree in your neighbor's yard to go to waste? Well, look no further than the Spokane Edible Tree Project. Um, what they do is gleaning, so picking fruits that would otherwise spoil, and they reroute it to markets. Also for you green thumbs, there's the Master Gardener program. So that provides seasonal classes, education. Um, the WSU Extension offers these programs all throughout Washington State. Um, here is a an ad for an end of the season glean from this the edible tree project. So if you're if you're looking for something to do on Saturday, you can bundle up and go glean with the rest of the team. Then we have people with specific food preferences out there. Here are some ideas for making vegetables more palatable first of which is a vegetable list. Oftentimes when I have somebody with specific preferences, I'll use a list like this where uh, people can just X out the foods that they just can't stand and circle the ones that they may be able to live with or willing to try. Many times the dissatisfaction with vegetables is just the way that they're prepared. I've worked with people who tell me, I hate spinach. Then later tell me that it's the cafeteria canned spinach they dislike and actually love a good crisp spinach salad. So 
we have steaming, especially for those who can't chew raw vegetables or are in need of soft foods. For those who don't like raw carrots and raw celery and raw onion, um, who doesn't like raw onion? You can cook this in a, a stew. And sometimes that is just way more delicious than the raw veggies themselves. We have sauteing, for example, a stir fry with some spicy, delicious sauce. Or broiling and grilling and roasting so that your veggies are a golden brown. Yeah, I hope you brought lunch for this uh, webinar. This next consideration is not the most popular, but it can be quite effective for improving palatability of vegetables. For those who find that they are just consuming higher amounts of added sugar or sodium, um, and not necessarily from the salt shaker, but could be the hidden salts of deli meats and rotisserie chickens and TV dinners. Um, I often will, well, sometimes I will recommend a three week sweet and salty fast. Avoiding the added sugar and the high sodium can give the taste buds time to adapt and regenerate. It's pretty amazing how this happens. This usually takes about three weeks. So if you begin on November 1st, and your taste buds, your taste buds will be likely fully adapted by the 22nd. And by Thanksgiving, your new taste buds will start discovering the sweetness and salty flavors where they never thought possible. I've had folks tell me that, wow, I didn't realize bell peppers taste sweet. And, and tell me that um, salty foods or fried foods end up tasting way too overpowerful. Like, wow, there's way too much salt in that. I never realized. So sometimes a three week vacation from extra sodium and extra sweetener um, can really benefit our palate. If none of the above strategies work, we have a few last ditch efforts. Amazingly, I've had very picky veggie eaters fall in love with kale chips or seaweed snacks, these crunchy savory morsels. There are recipes for adding cheesy flavors like nutritional yeast or other spices like wasabi seaweed. This, these can be store-bought or homemade. These crunchy vegetables enable us to get adequate folate or, and zinc and magnesium and phytonutrients, which is a fancy way of saying vitamins that don't have names or that we can live without but not thrive without. And if all else fails, it's important to maintain nutrient adequacy with a shake or a multivitamin. Some examples of food-based shakes with uh, vitamins and minerals are the Orgain or Vega One or Garden of Life. All of these have a pretty decent micronutrient profile, the vitamins, minerals. Or you can take a multivitamin if possible, a food-based multivitamin, but if not, the synthetic ones will work just fine and cover your bases. Now, for those of you who don't like to do just one thing at a time, we can look for ways to incorporate veggies by substituting the snacks. Especially for those who don't have a lot of time to cook, Something like a three ingredient snack uh, or small meal can be pretty effective. So I give this resource out pretty frequently. Um, I really love how you can take a whole grain starch with a protein or a heart healthy fat and a fruit or a vegetable and kind of mix and match them. It's really yours to make, but some of my favorites would be the, the whole grain crackers with hummus and vegetables or I can do berries with yogurt and some nuts and seeds on top, or the old avocado and toast. Um, one of my personal favorites, uh, pita bread, olives, bell peppers with Greek yogurt. You have like an instant Euro right there. We also may be able to just simply sneak in the vegetables to our existing meal plant pattern. 
So here's just an example, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, let's say, that I've been following. And what I want to do is up my veggie intake. So I've taken basically the same ingredients and created these little um, quiches with a side of frozen blueberries. Um, the quiches could be just frozen and then just reheated in the oven. I don't have to think about it. Here, I just, um, I'm just adding vegetables to my existing sandwich and subbing chips for veggies. It's a real shame that a lot of the chicken noodle soups will have, um, oh, just little bits of carrot and, um, and celery, but we can really use the soup as a catch-all for lots of different vegetables. For those of you that love your blender, a great way to sneak in vegetables is a smoothie. So make sure to have some kind of protein in your smoothie. We have liquid of choice, the um, frozen fruit du jour, and we can sneak in greens. I find that especially citrus fruits will really mask the fact, like I'll forget that I'm drinking kale. And if you don't have time for any of this meal prep, if you're real busy, um, you can just dine out wisely. Even fairly conservative recommendations, like from the ADA, encourage a large portion of vegetables, half of the plate. And here are some other kind of take home tips for dining out wisely. Another option would just be have the food come to you. So CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. It'd be something like a box like this where you get a weekly or bi-monthly um, fruits and vegetables in your local area. Link Foods offers this in Spokane. So, so does Four Roots and Full Circle. And please, if you have any other suggestions, Add them to the chat and you can help make our services better and <laughs> we can work together. There's also this local harvest website that uh, by entering in your city and state can tell, um, bring up some other CSA box options. There's lots of grocery delivery services if you have no time for grocery shopping. Also, these meal delivery services have really become pretty popular in the last few years. Pantry Fuel is um, owned and operated by, uh, by a dear friend of ours in the Providence community and offers these sort of tray meals all ready to go. There's also Mom's Meals that offers the benefit of 30 days worth of meals or nearly four weeks of um, meals after discharging from the hospital. They have other um, meal delivery options as well. And Lean Kitchen is an example of a private company that offers these. Um, others include e-meals, Plate Joy, Plated, The Fresh 20, Bistro MD, Diet To Go. We also have these, these meal kits that offer the ingredients all pre-portioned. If you wanna do a little bit of cooking, um, other options include daily harvest, every plate and sun basket, I believe. Check me on that. Finally, we have the ambitious cooks among you out there. So first of all, important to be equipped with a grocery list. This is a really nice grocery list offered from Intermountain Healthcare that's based on the Mediterranean diet. Um, these green areas are unrestricted foods. Um, yellow is uh, throughout the week in moderation and red is special occasions. And so the, uh, the grocery list is color coordinated. 
oh, this is a um, dietitian's grocery list from yours truly. Here we have streamlined meal prep. So even if you like preparing meals, you don't want to spend all day in the kitchen. So something like a nourish bowl might be a good idea um, where you just prepare your grain, you chop your veggies, you prepare your protein and what other, whatever toppings. So you can kind of develop endless amounts of uh, different little nourish bowls. Or if you if you search for Buddha bowls on Pinterest or anywhere online, you can have all sorts of ideas for bowls like this. They, they can also be prepared ahead of time so that you have, you, you make four and you can kind of have them throughout the week. Here we have a list of, it's really important to have sauces so that vegetables taste good. So, Lots of different sauce options here with their various uh, ingredients. And if you're trying to reduce your oil intake, um, you can just substitute that with a little more vinegar or lime juice. Finally, we have vegetable forward recipes. Here is a snapshot of the American Heart Association's recipe page. There's also lots of really vegetable plant forward recipes from Dr. Furman's website. Yum, lots of soups coming up for this week. And now a big advertisement for Taste Atlas. I only recently came across this and um, I don't know how, uh, I've lived without it. So Taste Atlas is basically the Google Maps of recipes from all over the world. As you, you know, this is a still frame, but it, you know, if I were to zoom into Morocco, that would expand more and more options in that area um, that are region specific. Just stunning recipes all over the world. I can't say enough good things about Taste Atlas. Let's look at a few international vegetable-based soup options from Taste Atlas. So they have these really intuitive recipes like, um, I'm not a big fan of reading paragraphs while I'm uh, spilling a bunch of tomato sauce onto my paper. So, um, so I really like the in intuitive nature of these images. Um, we have all of our ingredient list there and uh, it, it what in what order they go into the pot. So there is a minestrone, we have a gazpacho, a borscht recipe, and chana masala. Another note, um, if you're the type of person who ends up buying a lot of vegetables with the best intentions and they go bad in the fridge, feel free to freeze your spinach and cauliflower and carrots and avocado and you can work these into these stews or, and soups. At Community Wellness here in our department, we've assembled our favorite recipe resources. So you're welcome to, um, to email us at the wellness email and request one of those or any of the other resources we've talked about. Um, finally, finally, we have free cooking classes available uh, through the American Diabetes Association or locally here at Second Harvest in their kitchen. They're the kitchen. So whichever obstacles make it tricky to receive the health benefits that you'd like from vegetables that vegetables can provide, we can find, we can work together to find solutions. So here at our Providence Community Wellness Department, we have upcoming events. Our weight management program and support group are ongoing. We will be starting another cohort of our blood pressure and tobacco cessation classes November 1st. We also offer the Diabetes Prevention Program, or known as the Prevent T2. The next cohort there will be January 11th. 
And um, I did mention this, I'll say it again. If, if you want any of the resources we reviewed today, you can um, contact us at the email address here um, and anything else community wellness related, you can contact us here. So I think we have a little bit of time for Q&A. Um, thanks for breezing through this with me. Awesome, thanks Riley. Um, I know because you're presenting, you're probably were taking a look at the chat. So there's a couple other ideas that people had put in there while you were doing this. And then again, if anyone has any questions as I'm going through this list, feel free to put it in the chat or in the Q&A as well. Um, someone in the chat has talked about frozen vegetables um, as a great way for like le uh, less preparation. Um, air frying vegetables as well. Someone said they really enjoyed that. Um, we've got someone here recommending Bountiful Baskets um, as another food service for you. Awesome. There's a couple more here that I found. Um, adding lots of spinach, um, just like you mentioned with your kale, doesn't change the taste too much in your smoothies and other soups and foods and things. Um, we've got um, someone else talked about green smoothies. Sounds like that's a pretty popular option here. Um, and then someone adds lots of vegetables to like spaghetti, to meatloaf, casseroles, trying to incorporate it into the meals there. Um, buying in bulk, um, frozen at Costco, so it's always on hand. Yeah, buying in bulk as far as the cost effective. Um, nice. ones there. So some different good ideas that people had mentioned in the chat. Um, otherwise, it doesn't look like there's any questions here in the Q&A, but we can hang out here for a few minutes. And if anyone's got any questions for Riley, you can uh, put it in the chat put it in the um, Q&A as well. Um, but there's lots of resources that Riley sent out here. So we will be sending out a recording of this presentation so you can have some of those resources. It'll come to an e your email. Um, so we'll give you lots of those resources that Riley mentioned here today. Um, someone else mentioned they have a salad master, which they enjoy. Um, Ooh, salad master. <laughs> and then we've got one question here from Tracy, Riley, for you asking about should leafy greens like kale be steamed for good absorption? Should they be what for good? Oh, steamed for good Beans. absorption. I see. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's kind of interesting. I mean, really, really, I like a variety of methods because some, um, you know, some preparation methods will uh, like cooking releases the, um, the nutrients. And then for some, um, some of the cooking uh, leaches them off. So, so yeah, uh, you know, those stews certainly because it's all within the pot, um, you're not draining any of those, any of those nutrients. Um, but, uh, but some, some become more available and uh, the fiber consistency changes with steaming. So you can have um, kind of pros and cons for each cooking method. Great. Um, and you mentioned a little bit at the beginning about leafy greens. Can you give some examples of what that would be? Um, they're just asking about some top top leafy greens as examples there. Yeah, great. You bet. Um, you know, the the darker the green, the more nutrient dense as a general rule. Um, but your your romaine or red leaf can work just fine. Um, certainly spinach and kale. Um, yeah, if I'm missing any, add it to the chat. Okay, great. Um, and then we've got someone here kind of asking opinions on both sides of, of the spectrum here. So um, they said they've got someone who is a true believer in the carnivore diet and they believe veggies are like poison. Can you just give your kind of opinion on that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, everybody is such a, um, it's just a case by case basis. Uh, you know, certainly we get a lot of people with keto and some keto carnivores out there. And um, gosh, I met a gentleman who'd been um, steady on uh, on a keto um, with a history of diabetes for uh, several years. And every six months he would um, have a carbohydrate day. <laughs> um, it was really interesting, but anyway, that's kind of an anomaly. Um, but really, you know, you, everybody's individual and unique, just work with your care team and um, to, to figure out what works for your body. So uh, so yeah, case by case basis. Um, and then there's a question here about um, giving 
all the lists of the websites. We'll send it out in an email. Um, so we'll send out the recording, but then try and give some of those resources that Riley mentioned in the email as well. So hopefully it'll just be that one-stop shop all in that email there for you as well. Nice. And then otherwise, that's that's all the questions that I'm seeing here, Riley. I'm hoping I'm not missing any. Oh yeah, thank you, Diane, for the chart and collard greens. Those are also leafy greens. Yeah, <laughs> yeah good leafy greens. And pea there. protein, nice. All right. Um, well, yeah, we can hang up for a few more minutes, but otherwise, um, that's it. We appreciate you being here, um, Riley, and presenting for us. So thanks for your time. Um, and we'll send out that email here in the next few weeks or so. Anytime. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thanks.